Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Identifying Driver Alterations and Therapeutic Options in Cancer. It is presented by Nicholas Schultz, PhD, the Head of Knowledge Systems at the Kravis Center for Molecular Oncology at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. I am Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Help Desk button located in the promotional board at the bottom center of your screen. Or use the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Schultz. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm happy to be here and be presenting about uh, my work and uh, hope that this will be useful for other people's research. So I'll talk about um, identifying driver alterations and therapeutic options in cancer and a uh, little bit of background. I run a research lab at Memorial Sloan Kettering, but I also lead an infrastructure group that builds uh, systems that help researchers and clinicians in the interpretation of genomic variants in cancer. And I'll focus mostly on, on those aspects in this, in this presentation. This is all motivated by this idea of um, uh, what we now call precision oncology. So the idea is that we are now able to um, identify alterations in tumor samples of, of cancer patients and use that information to infer uh, what kind of treatments uh, specific these patients might be sensitive to. And the power really here comes from the fact that we can now do this uh, in depth at individual patients, meaning we can uh, theoretically uh, quantify uh, and, and qualify changes in nucleic acids and proteins, small mo molecules. Uh, we can combine that with pathology and radiology information and all available clinical data. But then, and then we can integrate all of that. But then, the real advance uh, comes will or will eventually come from the fact that we can do this over and over again on thousands or hundreds of thousands of patients and learn from um, what we observed in patients, learn from how these patients were treated and how they responded. And that's really the, the ultimate goal of precision oncology. And I want to say we're, we're in the early stages of this. Um, a lot of what I'll talk about is, is using examples of what we, do, what we currently do with memorials from Kettering. Um, the focus of my presentation and the tools that I'm showing is more on the nucleic acid side, uh, as well as integration of nucleic acid uh, data, so mutations and copy number changes, and, and others with clinical data and then linking that to personal treatment and, and outcome. Just as a reminder for everyone, a fairly simple overview, but um, cancer is, is an event, is, is, a, is a disease that is based on genetic alterations that are, um, that, that um, genetic alterations in, in cells that gives cells a growth advantage over, over others. Um, these, um, these cells usually acquire these uh, alterations uh, sequentially uh, through genomic alterations that give these cells growth advantages. So it's a little bit like evolution, um, but, but much faster. It happens during the lifetime of an individual, not over many, many lifetimes. Um, certain events uh, can increase the rate at which these mutations accumulate, accumulate. For example, mutations in DNA damage repair genes or cell cycle checkpoints, and then over time, many of these alterations develop. Uh, the ones that uh, confer a growth advantage to the cells we typically refer to as drivers, uh, and all others are, are passengers. And I guess one challenge is, um, and I'll get, come back to that, that we need to distinguish between 
between those two classes. Before we can distinguish, we need to measure, uh, we need to de detect these alterations. What we routinely do in clinical practice at Memorial Sloan Kettering is we use a targeted uh, gene panel that uh, covers cur currently 468 genes. We call it MSK Impact. It's a tumor, a matched tumor normal assay um, with about 600x, sometimes a little bit more of, of average coverage across the protein coding exons of these genes, as well as a couple of introns and key genes that are prone to re DNA rearrangements and, and subsequent RNA fusions. Uh, for all of these patients, we, we have a patient consent. We, um, some patients also sign a consent for germline analysis, uh, and then uh, after sample preparation, these samples get sequenced. Um, the uh, mutations are called using uh, state-of-the-art bioinformatics tools, and then all, each case gets reviewed manually, and the variants are signed out and then released to the oncologist and the patients. But also, and this is important for us on the research side, they're also released uh, for research purposes. Um, the test yields um, somatic as well as germline mutations when there's consent. Um, somatic alterations, specifically sequence mutations, so those are small uh, variants or, or larger indels, uh, copy number gains and losses. Um, the test can detect both uh, arm level events as well as focal copy number changes like amplifications and mutations. And then, like I said, for some genes, we can detect rearrangements and fusions. And as mentioned, germline mutations with additional consent are also available and can then also be um, reported back to the patient and the patient's family. This slide is just an overview of the genes that are in the essay. The, the first version had 341 genes, then 410 genes, and is now at 468 genes. And we've run about, we've run over 10,000 samples now on the 468 and another 13,000 or so on, on the previous panels. Back to this issue of, of drivers versus passengers, this slide here illustrates quite nicely that, in fact, most mutations that we observe in cancer samples are actually passenger events. So this slide is a, a, a slide by the Broad Institute, Gaddy gets this group from about five years ago, uh, where they showed graphically data from uh, all of the exomes that they had sequenced at the time. Most of these samples are cancer genome atlas samples and, and other research samples, but Basically, each dot is a tumor. Tumors are organized by tumor types from left to right. Uh, the y-axis indicates the number of mutations found in that tumor sample, normalized by the size of the genome. Um, and it's a, importantly, it's a log scale. So each uh, tick mark is an order of magnitude of more, more mutations. And you can see tumors on the left tend to be those that are hematologic in childhood with mutation rates of less than one mutation per megabit. Megabase, and then tumors on the right are those that tend to be um, uh, linked to a, a, a mutagen like melanoma, uh, has the sun that causes mutations, smoking causes mutations in, in lung cancers. And, and you can see that these tumors have orders of magnitude more mutations than the ones on the left. And just because they don't have that many more mutations doesn't mean they have that many more driver mutations. And in fact, most of these mutations are just random mutations. In, Produced by these mutagens, and they're um, just what we call passenger mutations. And the challenge really is to identify drivers among the many passengers. Another way of looking at this is looking at an example from the AACR Project Genius. So this graph here shows um, uh, an excerpt from 78,000 mutations that were found in 18,486 patients. Um, from left to right, it shows the most frequent mutations, and you can see the most frequent, there are very few mutations that are frequent. So KRAS G12B mutation on the very left is the most frequent mutation. We find it in 724 samples. BRAF is second, KRAS G12 is third, but then you can see this curve goes flat very quickly. And shown here, actually, just the 1,000 most frequent mutations. And on the right, you have the HER2 mutation, the HER2 mutation, B769H, which we find in five samples. But as you continue on to the right of this curve, the long tail, you will actually notice that out of the 78,000, 68,000 mutations are singletons, meaning these are mutations observed in only one patient of, of, of the cohort. It doesn't necessarily mean that they are non fatal and that they're passengers, but the chances are pretty high that these are, are passengers. And yeah, so simple message is a long tail. Um, there's a lot of noise here. 
but some signal and we need to be able to detect that, that signal in the noise. So how can we reduce the complexity in the data? How can we find that signal? How can we find those drivers? And I'm going to show three different ways of doing it, where the third one is in a way a combination of the first two. Um, the first one is recurrence. The second one is, is prior knowledge, knowing, annotating previously uh, known information. And then the third one is integrating those two and combining those with intuitive visualization and analysis. So recurrence analysis has been basically been around since the early days of cancer genomics, so more than 10 years now that we've been sequencing tumor genomes or exomes. Um, the, the Broad Institute has pioneered many of those, so for example, to, to detect frequency mutated genes, the, the music algorithm has in some sense always been the standard. And similarly, for copy number changes, the logistic algorithm does the same. The, both of these algorithm, algorithms detect the frequency of altered genes, either at the mutation level or the copy number level. But as we're moving um, deeper into cancer genomics, it's also become pretty clear that it's not just the genes that matter, but it's also the positions in the genes. And I want to highlight that here with the example of, of RB2. So we all know that RB2 is a cancer gene that is frequently amplified, specifically in breast cancer and gastric cancer, but it's also frequently mutated. But if you look at RB2 mutations across 16,000 mutations, and uh, you can see that the mutations that we observe are scattered across the, the protein. What we're looking at here is a, uh, a linear representation of the protein structure where the 1,255 amino acids in LB2 are, are lined up. And you can see the domains, for example, the, the kinase domain with the yellow domain on the right. Uh, each of these little lollipops indicates the position of mutations, and the height of the lollipop indicates how many mutations we have observed in these 16,000 tumors. So you can see many mutations, and all the green ones are missense, the black ones are truncating variants, and the, the brown ones, specifically around amino acid 800, those are in-frame insertions into the genes. And you can see that mutations occur in almost all parts of the protein, but many of them are just singletons that only, that we only observe them once. Then there are some exceptions, and those are what we call hotspots, and we'll get uh, deeper into those. So these are mutations that are more, that are recurrent, that are basically, that, that occur more frequently than maybe you would expect. How can you how can you uh, detect those um, systematically? So we, uh, what I'm showing here is an analysis by Barry Taylor's group here at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and they uh, initially assembled a cohort of about 10,000 tumor samples. Uh, later, upgraded that to about 25,000 tumor samples, and uh, came up with an algorithm that basically looks through all the mutations and tries to identify the amino acid positions that are more frequently mutated than expected by chance, and by chance it has a, a background model that takes into account the mutability of nucleotides in, in the trinucleotide codex, uh, the codon mutability itself, um, as well as the observed mutations across samples. And when they did that originally, they found that TP53 was the most frequently, was the gene with the most frequent hotspots, there were 52 hotspots on TP53, 19 in big 3 ca 14 in ABC, APC, and altogether, uh, they found hundreds of hotspots when they've, uh, they, they, they've since uh, upgraded this to a 25,000 tumor analysis and now find 1,165 hotspots in 247 genes. All of that information is available through a website, uh, which we maintain. It's called Cancer Hotspots, and the website is cancerhotspots.org. And you can interactively go through that website and, and find all of the genes as well as all of the, all of the amino acids that are we currently mutated, you can dive deeper and find out what the resulting amino acid changes are and also what the, um, uh, the distribution is across different uh, cancer types for each of these mutations. Going back to RB2, this was when they first ran this, uh, this analysis on the 10,000 tumors, they found six missense hotspots in RB2. Um, and you can see them uh, highlighted here, so S310, uh, was the most frequent of BD mutations, and you can see that that mutation is, uh, seems to be more common in bladder with 38 occurrences than breast, liver, and so forth. They also found the R678Q mutation, which was found in nine colon samples and a couple of other tumor types. The L755 seemed to be more breast-specific, 22 mutations there. 
duplication uh, of the Y772 seems to be non-small cell lung cancer specific, and then two other mutations in the kinase domain that are also um, even more breast or colon uh, enriched. The nice thing about all of these hotspots is they were eventually um, validated, or even they were before already validated to be, um, to be functional through uh, functional experiments, and you see the different papers here that described the effect and sometimes even the therapeutic implications. The, what I'm showing now is a zoom in onto uh, Irby2, not, no longer showing the most frequent hotspots, but you can see here the axis now changed. I'm now looking at mutations that are uh, recurrent at the level of between five and 10 mutations observed in, uh, uh, in the data set. And you can see now there are uh, a couple of those are recurrently significant hotspots, the ones that have the little flame icon. You can see the numbers are smaller, but they're clearly above background. So you can see another extracellular hotspot at D277 that seems to be bladder enriched, a colon enriched hotspot at, at amino acid 293. Um, D769 uh, is, is distributed nicely across different cancer types. But then one showed up that wasn't quite significant, and this is just to illustrate that the numbers as we're going to find more and more of these mutations as the numbers grow, but we found this one amino acid change at serine 335, which happened only twice, but both of the samples happened to be non-small cell lung cancer samples. And when we looked uh, a little more closely, we realized that these ERB2 mutations actually occur in uh, what, we, what we call a driver negative uh, lung adenocarcinoma samples. So here's the first of these examples, which has the CDKN2 mutation, which is a known driver, is SDK11, keep one. But none of these mutations are known drivers in the receptor tyrosine kinase RAS pathway, where we typically expect a driver in a lung cancer cell. So this ERB2 mutation, which at the time we didn't know how to interpret, is uh, likely the um, RTK RAS driver in that, in that particular sample. And the other non-small cell lung cancer, the other lung adenocarcinoma sample in which we found that mutation was very similar, also had an SDK11 keep one, no other driver, no EGFR, no RAS, no, no BRAF. So two examples that in addition to recurrence, uh, we'll, we'll probably keep finding more mutations as we grow our data sets. But eventually this mutation will also be statistically significant. So what I just showed was an, ex was an example of how to use recurrence uh, on a linear level, basically looking at if individual amino acids and asking if the individual amino acids are recurrently mutated, you can also do this in three dimensions. And we have done this. This is a paper published by JJ Gao in Genome Medicine, but other groups have done similar things where you basically take available protein structures of these, uh, of these cancer genes and then map mutations found in them into three dimensional space and ask if there are any three dimensional regions that are enriched for. Um, mutations. And when we did this, we found uh, hundreds of additional uh, hotspots, we call them 3D hotspots. Um, and we tried to distinguish uh, between them in different classes. So we had actually three types of mutated residues. Uh, the green ones here are those that are single residue hotspots. The blue ones are uh, residues, and you see this at the bottom here, the blue ones are linked to green ones. So those are these are, these are amino acid positions that are mutated, but that are close in three-dimensional space to known linear hotspots. And then maybe the most interesting new class are these orange ones that basically are not associated with any known linear hotspots, but together make up a three-dimensional hotspot. That uh, list is available as well on a similar website. So 3dhotspots.org is the, the domain for this one. And I'll show you later, this is also integrated into the CBIO portal for cancer genome as is cancer hotspots. The second way of reducing the data complexity is uh, applying uh, prior knowledge. Um, there's obviously a lot of information out there in the literature that describes specific mutations, that describes the known biochemical effect of these mutations, what, what happens to the protein, what happens downstream. There's a lot known about the clinical significance, and maybe most importantly for patients with these mutations, Drug sensitivities are well known for 
some of these mutations, and there's a little bit known about, about many more. Um, the question, of course, is how do you um, put that into clinical practice? So how can an oncologist identify a driver mutation when they see the patient? So what happens at MSK and more and more at other places now with uh, genetic testing available for tumor samples is uh, mutation is identified, and the oncologist now sees the report. In this case, the oncologist looks at a non small cell lung cancer case uh, with a BRAF K601E mutation without a database um, uh, uh, or, or a detailed report, the oncologist now has to consult the uh, FDA guidelines, the national, the NCCN compendium, has to maybe even look at PubMed to see uh, that maybe the best decision for this patient is, um, uh, is, is, is trametinib as a, as a drug. So what we are trying to do is basically put together a database that uh, contains all that information and basically assists these clinicians um, in, a, in a more automated way to, um, to get that information. We're obviously not the only ones, so there are a couple of knowledge bases out there that annotate somatic mutations. Uh, eight of them are shown on this slide. Um, my cancer genome was probably the first one out of Vanderbilt. Um, MD Henderson has an effort called Personalized Cancer Medicine. Mass General has one, Jackson Labs, uh, Cornell, Ohio State, um, Barcelona with a cancer genome interpreter, and maybe the one that I always sing out because it's, it's an open, a fully open approach is Civic from WashU, where it's almost like a Wikipedia of, of variant data and drug sens sensitivity data, where the idea is that anybody can. Um, Enter information, the information gets edited, gets gets approved, and is then made fully freely publicly available to, to the rest of the world. Our approach at MSK was a little bit different. So we um, uh, started, and this was partly in parallel with many of these other efforts, we started our own internal effort at MSK. We called that Onco KB, where we uh, built a database uh, around gene, gene annotation. Um, we spent um, thousands of hours basically on, on curating information. Um, everything was uh, curated, collected in a, in, a, in, a, in a curation platform that, that was developed here at MSK, and everything was collected in a, in a gene-centric effort where we uh, collected different variants per gene, uh, collected information about the effect of that variant, and then in addition for individual tumor types, collected information about uh, clinical implications across different cancer types, and I'll show you what that means. And our sources that we used were basically FDA guidelines, the NCCN guidelines, ASCO, as well as anything available in the, in the recent literature. Um, we also tried to, as best as we could, incorporate MSK oncology best practices. And to do that, we established uh, an expert review um, a committee, which currently has 22 clinicians who are on the committee that review a lot of the information and, and give us feedback on, on our data. The data is in part publicly available through a website at oncokb.org, where you can, if you go to that website, you'll see the current status of our annotations. We have 476 genes annotated, almost 4,000 variants, with uh, 86 drugs and 64 cancer types. And uh, a central piece of our annotation is what we call our levels of evidence system, which basically tracks um, the treatment implications of, of each mutation um, with a specific level. And we distinguish between uh, four different levels, where level one indicates uh, standard therapeutic implications. So an FDA, a level one mutation is an FDA-recognized biomarker that's predictive of response to an FDA-approved drug in a particular indication. So for example, BVAF E600E melanoma or specific EGFR mutations in lung cancer, those are level one. Level two is slightly below that where um, uh, these are standard of care biomarkers predictive of response uh, to an FDA approved drug. They're mostly NCCN guideline listed. So BRAF E600E in lung cancer, MET amplifications and splice mutations in lung cancer. Mm -hmm. And then 3A is one tier down where it's Basically, there is promising investigational data um, from clinical trials for sensitivity to this marker. So HER2 mutations, AKT, PIK3CA mutation, and breast cancer are in this category. Those are the A levels. And then level B are basically um, similar mutations, but found in tumor types for which there is not yet uh, 
promising sensitivity data. So BRAF, BC7, EM, uh, thyroid would be a 2B. HER2 amplification in lung cancer are 2B. And then similarly, any of these HER2 and AKT mutations found in bladder or other cancer types would be 3D. And then level four is, a, is the latest uh, alteration type that we added, uh, where there's compelling biological evidence or sort of preclinical data for a variant to be sensitizing to a drug. And level three A and four and four are really those patients that where maybe uh, an oncologist should consider enrollment in a clinical trial if, if available. You can go to the website and get more details about which of the genes are in each of the categories. Um, we have variant pages as well that give you more information about specific variants, their annotation level, as well as linked PubMed IDs to all of those. And here's just an overview of the different genes that are in each level. So we have 14 level one genes, 11 level two, 23 level three, and 16 level four. And these numbers are changing as we update the website about every one or two months or so. And that data is now uh, used internally at MSK, and it goes into the um, clinical sequencing reports that patients receive or oncologists receive for their patients. Here's an example of a, a de-identified redacted um, lung adenocarcinoma report where uh, two mutations were found through the MSK impact testing, and one was the EGFR in frame deletion, um, which is annotated in this report. You can see on the right, the blue bullseye icon indicates that it's a known or likely driver, and then the green level one icon indicates that it's a level one alteration. Um, the ARAF missense mutation has no annotation, so this is uh, a, variance of a variant of unknown significance. And if you look at the bottom of this report here, you can see uh, more details about the level one alteration. So in this case, this EGFR mutation will list the drugs that this alteration uh, might sensitize to, as well as a, a paragraph that describes the, the treatment implication. What we've now done multiple times uh, in different uh, contexts is to basically ask across a cohort of, of cancer patients from different cancer types, um, what is the, the rate of potential actionability across different cancer types? And when we do this, we've, we find that um, gastrointestinal stromal tumors or GISs are the, the, is the tumor type basically with the highest frequency of um, actionable tumors. So 75% of alteration of tumors have at least one level one or two A alteration in that tumor type. And those are uh, kit mutations for the most part. Thyroid cancer um, has a lot fewer of these, uh, has no level one alterations, but has a lot of level two B mutations. Those are BRF, E6, and E. And then a lot of three uh, A. And then breast stands out in the way, in the sense that it has the, the highest proportion of level three, three A alterations. So almost 50% of breast cancers are level 3A because they harbor uh, PIK3CA mutations, AKT mutations, or um, uh, ERB2 mutations. Uh, the ERB2 amplifications are make up this bottom 15% uh, or so that are, that are level one. And then if you go down this, this, this list of tumor types, you can see on the right, there are a, a couple of tumor types that have very few, even potentially actionable alterations that uh, at our current state of, of knowledge. While a lot of tumor types in the middle have uh, only those uh, that we call the B levels, where these alterations sensitize to certain drugs in other cancer types, but it's not yet proven or known um, that these same alterations sensitize to the same drugs in these tumor types. So the last part of this presentation will be showing you how we try to tie all of those different pieces of information together in intuitive visualization and analysis tools. Um, so what we are, what we have been building over the last 10 years, and this really started with the Cancer Genome Atlas, uh, was a system that we call the CBIO portal for cancer genomics. And this we started building this with the very first uh, TCGA project that was glioblastoma at the time. But even though compared to what we have now, this was a relatively small data set, it was already clear to us then that um, the scale of the data was just more than most biologists and clinicians could uh, and should handle. Um, it was only 91 samples at the time that were profiled 
uh, but for each sample we had mutation data, copy number data, mRNA, methylation, clinical data, and that data really just was presented to, to the researchers in spreadsheets, in text files or in spreadsheets. And it was pretty clear that there were some bioinformatics uh, folks that could analyze this data, but most of the, the, the researchers and clinicians, that, the ones that were really equipped to interpret the data, they couldn't actually handle the data computationally. And doing that in Excel spreadsheets was, was just not, not the way to go. So we thought of ways to make to bridge that gap and we started building the CBIO portal and we put the data into a database and then gave people easy access to the data, initially just really downloading slices of the data, downloading just a few genes and a few samples as opposed to having to download matrices of 20,000 genes times 91 samples. But then fairly quickly, we started layering all these different visualizations on top of it. And you can see some of them here and I'll later show in a little uh, live video what that what what the portal looks like in, in action. Uh, a couple of years ago, we made an important step, and that was that we we made the CBIO portal uh, open source. That means we released the all of the software code for the software publicly and made it made it available for anybody to use and to modify. So um, anybody can go to GitHub and look at the code, download the code, install it locally, but also make modifications. The only uh, a uh, thing we ask, and this is we make sure that this happens via the AGPL license, so that, is that all modifications are contributed back so that anybody can benefit from the modifications. And this has worked really well, and the software is now developed and maintained uh, at multiple institutions, so uh, led by, by us at MSK and uh, Ethan Sarami's group at Dana-Farber, but also done in collaboration with Princess Margaret, CHOP, Cornell, and then the Hive, and the Hive is a small bioinformatics uh, company in the Netherlands that really builds uh, solutions around open source software. They have helped us tremendously and they help um, pharma clients um, who want to set up local versions of the CBIO portal or who want to develop features for the portal. They consult very closely with us. Um, and as a result, the portal is now installed at dozens of institutions across the world, uh, including um, including many companies. And these maps here really, I think, are just the tip of the iceberg that show you uh, where in the U.S. and around the world we have versions of the CBIO portal that we know about. Maybe uh, more informative is the graph on the left uh, that tracks the number of unique users that we have, and that's growing year by year, the number of help requests that we're getting uh, through our Google group, and we've now made efforts to really um, um, respond to all of these user queries, and we've gotten much, much better at that. And then also the, the number of citations that the portal has been getting um, in the scientific literature and the public site that's at cbioportal.org has currently about uh, 36,000 uh, samples that are available for for viewing and I'll show you um, how some of that works in my in my demo in a, in, a, in a minute or so and this slide just really illustrates how we're using the cbio portal at msk but it's representative of how any other center that uses the data for uh, mining of their own internal private data would use it. So Dana-Farber has a similar system. Many pharma companies have it. Many other research centers and hospitals as well. Um, so we, uh, obviously, at the on the left side here, you have the TCGA data, the ICGC data, and other public data, which we curate from the literature and put into the CBIO portal. That's available to anybody at cbioportal.org. But we also have um, pipelines that can handle foundation medicine data and to feed that into the portal and make it available to uh, our researchers. Um, and then everything that is uh, comes out of the, the, the Center for Molecular Oncology for Research Sequencing, as well as clinical sequencing, is also um, moved into CBIO portal in, in, in real time. So the moment the sample is sequenced, it gets entered into the CBIO portal where it can then uh, be visualized and a bigger challenge for us is currently to uh, bring in the matching clinical data. So genomic data is by definition structured, but we are trying to find ways to um, bring in more automated uh, clinical annotation about these samples. The current model that still works the best is, is really um, working with a clinician, an RSA, a med student, or, or, or something, someone similar and, and collecting data manually and putting it in spreadsheets still works, but as we're now approaching 30,000 sequence uh, clinical samples, we 
gets harder and harder. So we really have to improve our, our ability to automate the, the transfer, maybe even go upstream and automate the capture of the data. Um, and then just to tie it all together, on the right of the slide, you can see uh, the information that I talked about earlier in my presentation. So the uh, CBIO portal also has annotation layers where you bring in uh, information from OncoKB, for example, but also from, from the civic database about the variant effect and therapeutic options about individual variants. And that is uh, shown in many different places of the portal and can be used interactively, as well as information from cancer hotspots and the cosmic database. On, on recurrence. And in the last part of this demonstration, I will just show a live demo of how the CBIO portal works, and I'll run through a couple of examples of how to interact with the portal, how you can start a query from what we call the study view, which is a little view of samples across a cohort, and then how you can dive deeper into a cross-cohort analysis, or even go all the way down into this, uh, a single patient's uh, view where you can see all samples associated with a, a particular patient along with clinical data uh, all the way down to treatment information about that patient. For all of my examples of the CBIO portal, I will use the public site, which is accessible at cbioportal.org. And I will be using Google Chrome, which is our preferred browser, but the portal also supports um, Firefox as well as Safari. Um, Internet Explorer, we really can't guarantee that it will work. Uh, newer versions should work, older versions uh, definitely don't. When you come to the public site, you will see um, on the left, um, you see a, an overview of, of tissue types from which you uh, can select cancer studies. And on the right, you see a full overview of all the studies in the portal, and there are 216 studies currently. So you can scroll down here and see all the different studies, number of samples, uh, sources, etc. Very useful is this little field up here where I can start searching. Um, and I'm looking for the TCGA Pan Cancer Atlas data set in, in, for this example. So when I type TCGA Pan Cancer Atlas, I get 33 matching studies. I can select them here with one click and then scroll down to select uh, mutations and copy number, which is the default. I'm going to look at all samples. And then I enter my gene or genes of interest. In this example, I want to go back to the ERBB2 example from earlier in my presentation to show you how you can visualize the data that I showed in real time in the CBIO portal. So I enter my gene, I hit submit, and what the portal now does, it, is go, it goes through um, these 33 studies and looks for alterations in ERBB2 in each of those studies and then summarizes them across studies. And by uh, alterations, the portal considers uh, four alteration types. Uh, number one is mutations. These are somatic mutations, non-synonymous. Two is amplifications, three is deletions, and four is gene rearrangements or fusions. So what you're looking at here now is a bar graph that shows you the alteration frequencies of ERBB2 across different cancer types, sorted from left to right by decreasing frequencies. So esophageal cancer is the cancer type with the highest alteration uh, rate, followed by stomach and bladder. But you can also see, um, in addition to this tailing off here, where a couple of cancer types on the rest, like on the on the right, like mesothelioma or chromophore kidney, have no alterations whatsoever in ERBB2. What you can also see is the types and the patterns of alterations. So Esophageal and stomach is dominated by the red part of the bar, which reflects the amplifications. And when you hover over, you can see frequencies for each of the events. So 11% of esophageal cancer is, has an ERBB2 amplification, but only 2.75% um, have, have a mutation. That pattern shifts a little bit in bladder, where we see 11% uh, mutation frequency, but only 4% amplification frequency. And then maybe most pronounced melanoma has a mutation frequency of 7%, but no amplifications whatsoever. And what you're looking at here at the top is the lollipop diagram, that same linear domain structure, 1,255 amino acids, and then mutations uh, dotted along that axis. You can see the clustering of mutations in the kinase domain over here. You can see that uh, extracellular hotspot at S310. And then below, you see a table that shows for each mutation, the study or the cancer type that it was found in, the sample ID, 
cancer types spelled out, as well as the exact amino acids change, uh, annotations, which I'll come back to, the type of mutation, missense, the copy number status of that gene in that sample, uh, the cosmic count, meaning the number of times that particular mutation was seen in cosmic, uh, the allele frequency, which shows you what the read coverage was in that TCGA sample and how many of the reads supported the mutation. So in this ex example, it's a 42% allele frequency, 13 out of 31 variants supporting the mutation. And then last is the number of mutations found in that sample altogether, which is a good indicator for whether or not a sample might be hypermutated or not. And then back to the annotation column, this is now tying in some of the resources I showed earlier. So this V842i mutation, for example, is labeled here with the blue bullseye, which indicates that it's a driver event, according to OncoKB. And it has a level number uh, associated with it, indicating that's a level three alteration. And you can hover over that and now see more information about that mutation, including an explanation for why it's a gain-of-function mutation, including two uh, references here that are linked, as well as uh, more information about um, the level of alteration and the drug that the drug or drugs that this mutation might sensitize to, including citations for um, the sensitivity. We also have information from the Civic database here next to it, and you can click on on these links and it, it'll it'll take you to civic uh, my cancer genome is linked and then any mutation that is a statistically recurrent hotspot according to cancerhotspots.org also has this little flame icon you can now interact with the table on the top and for example click on any of these mutations oh sorry with the lollipop plot on top and then the bottom table uh, updates and filters basically to what what you have selected uh, you can unselect these changes. You can also s s click over here and say, show me only the missense mutations. Uh, resetting the filters is here. Or show me only the in-frame mutations. And you can see there are very few, but they're all clustered in this one region in the kinase domain. And many of them are lung cancer samples, which you can sh see down here. And then the last thing I wanted to show here is how to filter this table and the lollipop diagram based on this little search box. So you can go in here now and type in breast and it'll show you all the breast cancer mutations. And you can nicely see the pattern of, of clustering of mutations in the kinase domain. The most common one is the L755 mutation. Colorectal will probably look similar. Oh, let me do colon, uh, where you can see kinase domain mutations, including the V77. Um, bladder will look different where we have a lot of these extracellular do domain mutations and still a couple of kinase domain mutations and then maybe last is lung where we expect to see these um, in frame insertions and deletions in the in the kinase domain for my next example I'm back at the home page and I'm now looking at the MSK impact clinical sequencing cohort study. That is the top first study that everybody sees. It has 10,945 samples and I'm clicking on this little icon here, the study summary. And that takes me to a new, a different page, which is a summary of all the genomic alterations as well as clinical attributes of samples in that cohort. This is a cohort that consists of multiple different cancer types. So it looks a little bit different than many other studies. Uh, so there are 10,945 samples from 10,336 patients. The samples break down by cancer type in the following way, where we have 1,600 uh, and more non-small cell lung cancer samples, uh, 1,300 breast cancer samples, and you can see the list goes on. Some of the rarer tumor types are at the bottom here. Uh, mesothelioma, for example, we have 107, and some of them are very rare and uh, are only scarcely represented. The diagram on the right here represents the number of mutations found in each sample on the y-axis and the degree of copy number changes on the x-axis. Each dot is a tumor sample. Um, so tumors up here have low copy number burden, copy number alteration burden, but very high mutation count. And uh, these samples over here have a very low mutation burden, but a very high fraction of their genomes altered by copy number changes. Um, th this is a summary now of the gene mutation frequency. So TP53 is the most frequently mutated gene in this MSK impact cohort. And as a reminder, this is the uh, targeted gene sequencing cohort that has no more than 468 genes sequenced. 
41% of the samples have a TP TP53 mutation, 15% of a KRAS mutation, 13% of a TERT mutation, most of these are TERT promoter mutations, and then 12% of a PIK3CA mutation. The next table shows you copy number changes, so the most frequent deletion is that of CDKN2A and B on chromosome 9P, which happens in about 7% of our cohort, uh, and the most frequent amplification is cyclin D1 followed by MIC and ERB2, which all occur at about 4%. And there's more information here, for example, uh, the, the sex distribution of the cohort is about 50-50. We have the patient's vital status, uh, life deceased. We have uh, sample types, whether a primary or a metastasis was, was uh, analyzed and, and many more pieces of information. This entire page is interactive, so I can go in here now and select the non-small cell lung cancer samples. And now this cancer type detail table becomes relevant because I can now go in further and uh, decide whether I'm interested in lung adenocarcinoma or squamous on um, small cells, I'm, I'm selecting uh, lung adenocarcinoma in this example. So 1,300 samples are lung adenocarcinoma. You can see the red samples now indicate, uh, sh show you the mutation burden in these samples, which is lower than some of these really hypermutated ones, but there's some outliers here of, of high mutation burden. And now all the tables and charts have updated and you can see T53 is still the most frequently mutated gene in this cohort, 51%, followed by KRAS, EGFR, SDK11, and, and KEEP1. Amplifications and deletions have changed a little bit. EGFR has now moved up to the most frequently copy number altered gene at 8%. So I can now start using this page to select genes. I can select them here. And when I select them, they show up up here in this in this little box. I can also search for genes. Uh, we looked at ERB2 earlier, so I can find ERB2 here, click on it, select it. Um, and then you can uh, enter more genes over here. So I'm actually going to rearrange this just a little bit and show you a couple of other genes. Red Ross and ALK are the ones that are altered by fusions frequently. I'm going to move KRAS over here, NRAS. NF1, BRAF, and MAP2K1. So these are sort of driver genes that are very well known in lung cancer. And then I click the query button, and that will take me to a, a new view, and that is what we call the Oncoprint. The Oncoprint will show you the genes you've selected from top to bottom. And then the samples that you've selected, in this case, um, 1,269 lung adenocarcinoma samples in this cohort. And then this basically is... Um, like a, a matrix of genes versus patients. I'm just zooming out so that you can see the entire cord, cord all at once. What you can now see is the frequencies of each gene at which they're altered and the types of events uh, in, in those genes. So EGFR is altered in 30%, but those 30% are broken down into samples that have the green ones are missense mutations, the dark red ones here or the brown ones are in-frame insertions and deletions, the tall red rectangles are amplifications, and then you can see combinations of mutations and amplifications. And the purple ones here are rearrangements or, or gene fusions. Uh, the black uh, dots here are, are truncating mutations, or in this particular case, splicite mutations, which actually lead to in-frame uh, sp splicing events and, and MET. But here, NF1 has a couple of these truncating events. And you can add some clinical tracks here or other genomic data tracks. So I'm adding total number of mutations here on top. And what you can now appreciate is how the overall mutation burden in a sample tracks with some of the mutations that we see. So um, I introduced the, the OncoKB database earlier, as well as cancer hotspots. And you can see that each mutation here is annotated with respect to whether or not that mutation is, is known, a known driver, uh, either by OncoKB or by cancer hotspots. And there are a couple of mutations over here that are light green. So those are missense mutations that are not known to be drivers. So you can see a couple of them in UGFR. You see a couple of them here in RIT, and then ROS, and ALK, and ALK is a very long gene, so you expect to see more of them. And you can nicely see, if you track this line all the way to the top here, that many of these mutations actually track with increased mutation burden, which is what you would expect. A hypermutated tumor has more uh, passenger mutations, but it also tends to be the samples, and if you look down here at KRAS now, where these, these samples have other events. So this mutual exclusivity that you, that you expect in lung cancer samples is, is not quite there because of these samples. But you can uh, modify any of what you want to display here. You can uh, 
choose to deselect the OncoKB driver annotation or hotspot. You can implement simple counts, whether you want the, the count to just be across the bio portal or use the cosmic counts, but you can go as far as hiding the variance of unknown significance. And if I do that, the OncoPrint will re-render and will now show me a much cleaner version where all of these VUSs are missing. And you can see the mutual exclusivity across the cohort looks much better where most of the KRAS mutations, with the exception of NF1, which is well known, um, don't overlap with any of the other driver cases in lung adenocarcinoma. And with that, I want to acknowledge all the different people involved in the work. So, um, from my group at MSK, particularly JJ Gao, who leads the C Bio Portal and OncoDB front end development, Benjamin Gross leads the, the, the back end development for the C Bio Portal, and Yanni Chakravati, who is the lead scientist for OncoKB. I want to acknowledge with my um, collaborators in the CMO, Barry Kaler, Mike Berger, Dave Solid. Collaborators in the CBIO portal network, most importantly, Ethan Sarami and Chris Sander and Dana Farber. And then, obviously, the clinical leadership at MST, who's um, who made this possible along with all the other funders of our work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Schultz, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live QA portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click the Send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. The first question is, is there a way I can visualize my own data in the CBIO portal? That's a great question. So we, we don't, unfortunately, don't have a way yet where you can just click one button and upload a data set and see that data set all the way through in CBIO portal, the way you would see all the data sets that we have pre-curated for you. Um, but there are a couple of options. One of them is we have a couple of tools that you can use that are on the website where you can upload little bits of data. So for example, we have um, a way where you can upload a mutation file and you get uh, a lollipop plot, say a plot that I showed earlier with all the different mutations across the domain structure, um, or an oncoprint. Uh, you saw the oncoprint in the video. You can get an oncoprint if you download, if you upload your data in the right format. All of the other things that I showed are currently not available that way. The other option is that you can download a local version. You can install a local version of CBIO Portal, but that requires that you have some system administrator skills. Or maybe best for everybody is you talk to someone at the institution them to maybe set up a local version of CBIO Portal for the entire institution. The software is free, obviously. The maintenance requires some work, so you need someone skilled at the institution who can host that system for you. But you can start small. You can set it up on a local machine and then eventually put it on a, on a bigger server or put it in the cloud. And we're happy to help with, if there are questions about it, how to do that. And we have very good documentation of, around that, too. Thank you. Is Anko KB freely available for use by others? Um, yes and no. So it's... Uh, a little bit tricky. So OncoKB is free, fully available and uh, for, for research use, and you can see that it's being used by many different publications uh, out there. So for research use, it's freely available, no restrictions whatsoever, but we currently have don't have the ability to license it for commercial uh, use or for use in patient annotation. So that's something that hopefully will change in the future, but currently just, we, we don't have a way to enable that. Thank you. We have time for one more question. It looks like the spectrum of ERBB2 mutation differs across tumor types. Do we know yet which of these mutations sensitize to HER2 inhibitors, and are there differences between specific mutations and tumor types? Yeah, so this goes back to the last plot that I showed earlier, where I showed the different um, hotspots across the ERBB2 domain structure. It was pretty clear that um, the distribution across different cancer types is not random. So the S310F mutation is much more common in bladder and other cancer types. And then breast cancers are, have more, more commonly have mutations in the kinase domain, and, and colorectals do too, but it looks slightly different and not the same. Non-small cell lung cancer you saw had 
these in-frame and social deletions in the kinase domain. So it's, um, it's clear that there are different patterns across cancer types. I think the Naratnip study, the early results that this, uh, came out uh, show quite convincingly that breast cancer samples tend to um, respond better to the HER2 inhibitors, but there is not yet, well, I think there's not, not much data yet that shows that the other cancer types respond better, but there's probably also not enough data yet. So I think the numbers are so small. What we really need is many more treated patients that are put on a HER2 inhibitor specifically because of the mutation so that over time our body of data grows to the point where we can actually uh, stratify the response analysis, not just by mutated or not, but also by in what cancer type, which particular mutation, and then maybe even more importantly after that, what's the co-mutation context, which other genes were mutated in what way in the same sample, so that maybe those patients respond better that had no other alterations in, a, in the same or a similar pathway versus those that did. So I think we really need a lot more data to, to answer that question convincingly. I'm going to take time for one more question. Are there any new features on the horizon for the CBIO portal? Yeah, so we have, we're working on a, on a lot of new features. So we, our feature development was slowed down a little bit by the need to re-architect or re-engineer the entire CBIO portal. So the CBIO portal has been growing for 10 years now. So you can imagine like anything you build, you build on top of old things and eventually things just don't work as efficiently anymore. And so what we decided to do about a year or so ago is to basically re-engineer the entire software and bring it up to um, 2018 software engineering standards. Uh, that was painful and took some time. But I think in, in the next two months or so, we'll be finished with that. And you'll, you'll be, if you look at our news and over the last year, you'll see we've incrementally updated bits and pieces of the portal at the expense of not being able to release too many new features. But once that is done, we'll focus on, on new features. And we have a lot of those in the pipeline. Maybe most, the most exciting one is allowing users to select subgroups of, of samples and asking the portal for differences between them, which genes are differentially mediated between the groups. What's the survival difference between the groups, two groups or three groups? What's the difference between primary and metastatic samples? Uh, that's just one example of many more that are, that are coming. And if there are any well, requests, I, you, can, you can certainly send them along to us. And we'll, well, thank you. I would like to once again thank Dr. Schultz for his presentation. I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through September 21st, 2018. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Bye.